Kyrgyzstan, 1965. A Soviet paleontologist cracks open a slab of rock from the Matagen Formation and finds something that should not exist. A reptile, frozen mid-glide. Wings stretched wide, but the wings are not on its arms. They are on its legs. One fossil. One terrible idea. And the reason evolution tried this design exactly once, looked at the results, and immediately gave up. For 220 million years, every flying and gliding animal on Earth followed the same blueprint. Wings on the front, arms do the flying, legs do the landing. It is the rule that bats, birds, pterosaurs, and even flying squirrels all obey. Sheravipteryx broke that rule, and it paid the price. This is the story of nature's worst experiment, a creature so badly designed that only one fossil was ever found, because evolution looked at what it created and said, never again. The Matagen Formation in Kyrgyzstan is a paleontologist's nightmare. 225 million years old, Middle Triassic sediments deposited in an ancient lake bed where creatures fell, died, and were preserved in fine-grained stone. The site is remote, on the southwest edge of the Fergana Valley. Soviet expeditions in the 1960s were mapping fossil beds when they found it. A single slab of rock, maybe 30 centimeters long. Inside, a complete skeleton, dorsal view. Bones still articulated and stretching from the hind limbs to the tail. Impressions of a membrane. Not feathers, not scales, a flight membrane. Alexander Sharf examined the specimen in 1971 and knew immediately this was wrong. The membrane was attached to the legs. The hind limbs were massively elongated. The femur and tibia were each longer than the entire body length. And the front limbs were tiny, vestigial, useless. He named it Podopteryx mirabilis, which means footwing. But that name was already taken by a damselfly. So in 1981, it was renamed Sharovipteryx mirabilis, which means Sharov's wonderful wing. Wonderful might be an overstatement. Because what Sharov discovered was evolution's single attempt at building a delta wing glider out of a reptile. And the fossil record shows it tried this exactly once. One specimen ever found. No relatives, no descendants, no follow-up designs. Just this one fossil, frozen in the rock, legs spread wide, membrane stretched tight, captured at the moment it was gliding through a Triassic sky. Now here is where it gets weird. The Soviet Union in 1971 was not exactly known for sharing fossil discoveries with the West. Cold War paleontology was a real thing. Research got buried in Russian journals. Specimens sat in Moscow museums where Western scientists could not study them, and Sheravipteryx became a legend based on grainy photographs and second-hand descriptions. For decades, paleontologists knew this creature existed, but they could not examine it properly, could not verify the measurements, could not study the membrane structure up close. It was like discovering an unidentified flying object and then locking it in a basement for 30 years. By the time Western researchers finally got access to the specimen in the early 2000s, the fossil had become damaged during preparation. Whoever cleaned the rock around the skeleton in the 1970s chiseled away parts of the slab that might have contained crucial evidence. Parts of the forelimbs are gone, areas around the chest were destroyed, the very regions that would tell us how this animal actually flew are missing which means we are stuck doing forensic reconstruction on a fossil that was partially obliterated by a Soviet rock chisel. The forensic evidence is written in the bones themselves. Start with the hind limbs. The femur and tibia are grotesquely elongated, each bone longer than the torso. In a normal reptile, legs are for running, climbing, gripping. In Sherovipteryx, they are structural supports for a wing. The fifth toe is elongated and projects backward toward the tail. The membrane attached here, creating a triangular wing surface that stretched from pelvis to tail to toe. Under magnification, the fossil preserves striations in the membrane, fiber bundles radiating outward from the legs. These are not random. They are structural reinforcements, like the ribs in a bat wing or the struts in a parachute. The fibers prevented flutter. When the membrane was deployed, these fibers kept it taut and aerodynamically stable. The membrane also shows creases. Even when the legs were extended, the membrane did not fully flatten. It retained folds exactly like modern flying squirrels. This suggests Sheravipteryx could not fully retract its wings. The membrane was always partially deployed, which means walking on land was awkward. Climbing was difficult. Running was nearly impossible. Evolution gave this animal wings and in doing so made it helpless on the ground. 
Now examine the forelimbs. They are tiny, maybe one-tenth the length of the hind limbs. In 2006, researchers published a biomechanical analysis in the Journal of Evolutionary Biology. They modeled Cheirovipteryx flight dynamics and discovered something terrifying. Without forewing membranes, this animal could not glide safely. The center of lift was too far back. All the wing surface was concentrated at the rear of the body. In flight, the animal would pitch forward uncontrollably. It could not stabilize, and it could not land without crashing. The only solution would have been tiny membranes on the front limbs acting as canards, like the small wings on the nose of a conquered jet. But here is the problem. The area around the forelimbs and the fossil was completely destroyed during preparation. The rock was chiseled away to expose the hind limbs, and any trace of forewing membranes was obliterated. So we'll never know for certain if Cheirovipteryx had them. If it did, it could glide. If it didn't, every flight ended in a controlled crash. Either way, this design was doomed. Let's compare Cheirovipteryx to every other gliding animal that ever existed. Flying squirrels, membranes stretched from wrist to ankle, four limbs working together, balance, maneuverable, flying lizards called Draco. Ribs extend outward to support membranes. Wings deploy from the torso, compact, efficient. Pterosaurs, wings supported by a single elongated finger. Massive flight muscles anchored to the chest, built for power. Bats, wings stretching from elongated fingers controlled by wrist joints, precise, agile. Birds, feathers attached to arm bones, flapping powered by pectoral muscles, the most successful flying design ever evolved. All of them follow the same rule. Wings on the arms, power from the chest, legs free for landing. Cheirovipteryx put wings on the legs. No chest muscles for power, arms useless, pelvis not reinforced for flapping. It is a design that works once. For one glide from one tree, then you are on the ground and you cannot take off again. To launch, you need to climb, and to climb, you need arms. The arms of Cheirovipteryx were too small to grip anything. Let's talk about the Middle Triassic for a second. 225 million years ago, this was not a chill time to be alive. The Great Dying had just wiped out 90% of all life on Earth 10 million years earlier. The planet was still recovering, and in that recovery period, evolution was throwing ideas at the wall to see what stuck. Gliding reptiles were everywhere. Icrosaurus had elongated ribs that folded out like a fan. Kinosaurus had the same setup, rib-supported membranes. Calurosaurus was even weirder, with extra bones sticking out of its sides to support gliding membranes. These animals were all experimenting with the same basic idea. Jump off something tall, stretch out your body, glide to safety. But they all used ribs or modified torso structures. Arms and legs stayed normal. Cheirovipteryx looked at that playbook and did the opposite. Instead of keeping its legs normal and modifying the torso, it turned its legs into the entire wing structure and made its arms essentially useless. It's like evolution dared itself to build the worst possible glider and then actually tried it. The fossil shows the animal spread eagled, legs extended 90 degrees from the body, tail stretched straight back. This is the gliding posture, but it was also the landing posture. That means every landing was a full body impact. Legs absorbed the shock and the tail acted as a rudder. There was no way to slow down gently. Modern gliding lizards can adjust their ribs mid-flight to control speed and angle. Cheirovipteryx wings were fixed. Once the legs were extended, the membrane was deployed. No adjustment, no fine control, just aim and hope. Aerodynamic models show Cheirovipteryx could glide at shallow angles, maybe from 20 to 30 degrees. That is better than some modern gliders, but maneuverability was limited. To turn, it had to shift its weight, twist its hips, bend its tail. There were no wing flaps, no aileron control, just body movements translated into directional changes. Landing was the nightmare scenario. The fossil pose suggests the animal died mid-glide. Maybe it hit the water surface at speed and was instantly buried in sediment. The bones show no signs of scavenging, no bite marks, no missing pieces. It fell. It sank. It was entombed. And 225 million years later, that is how we found it. Cheirovipteryx lived in the Middle Triassic 225 million years ago, before dinosaurs dominated, before pterosaurs took to the skies, before any animal had figured out how to fly properly. This was the experimental phase of flight evolution. Creatures were trying everything. Elongated ribs, membrane wings, feathered limbs, gliding, leaping, falling with style. Most experiments failed. We know they failed because we do not see them today. 
Sheriff Iptrix was one of those failures. It evolved in a specific environment. Ancient lake shores, tall trees, open water. Perfect for gliding from tree to tree, landing on the water's edge, climbing back up and repeating. Except it could not climb, not with those tiny arms. So every glide was a one-way trip. Launch from the tree, glide to the shore, crawl awkwardly on land with wings dragging, hope you find a low branch or a slope you can scramble up using your feet, then repeat. It is a lifestyle that works only if nothing goes wrong. If you land perfectly, if you don't miss your target, if no predators are waiting on the ground, one mistake and you are dead. Now, let us talk about what was waiting on the ground in the middle Triassic. Rauisuchians were the apex predators of the Triassic. They were crocodile relatives that walked upright on two legs. Some were 20 feet long, built like tanks with jaws that could crush bone. They patrolled the shorelines of ancient lakes looking for anything stupid enough to be crawling around on land. Sheravipteryx was exactly that stupid. Every time it landed, it was vulnerable. Membranes deployed, arms useless, legs stretched out to maximum extension. It could not run. It could not defend itself. Itself, it could barely crawl. And Rawasuchians had excellent vision. They could spot movement from hundreds of meters away. One bad landing near a hungry predator and Sheravipteryx was lunch. This was not a theoretical threat. We have found Rawisuchia fossils all over the same formations where Sheravipteryx lived, the same time period, the same environment. They were actively hunting these animals. The fossil record confirms this. One specimen ever found. Compare that to flying lizards like Draco. We have found hundreds of fossils. Living species exist today. Millions of years of success. Or consider pterosaurs, thousands of fossils and dozens of species. They dominated the skies for 160 million years. Bats emerged 50 million years ago and are still thriving today with 1,400 living species. Sherovipteryx, one fossil, one species, and then silence. Evolution tried delta wing reptiles with leg wings. It did not work and it was never attempted again. Here is the forensic conclusion. Sherovipteryx was not killed by a predator. It was killed by its own design. The membrane striations suggest the wings were always partially deployed, even at rest. That means walking required dragging a wing membrane behind each leg. The elongated hind limbs made running impossible. The tiny forelimbs made climbing nearly impossible. The fixed wing shape made precise landings impossible. This animal was trapped by its own anatomy. It could glide, but only once, and only if everything went perfectly. The fossil posture tells the rest of the story. Legs spread, tail extended, membrane deployed. It was gliding. Then it hit the water, too fast, too steep. The impact knocked it unconscious. It sank into the lake sediments. Fine silt covered the body. The bones were preserved in perfect articulation, and that is how it stayed for 225 million years until Alexander Sharov cracked open a rock slab in 1971 and found evolution's mistake. The really unsettling part is what did not happen next. After Sherovipteryx, no other reptile tried this design. No leg wing gliders in the late Triassic, none in the Jurassic, none in the Cretaceous. Nothing. Evolution looked at Sherovipteryx and concluded delta wing leg gliders were a dead end. Every flying animal since then has used arm wings. Pterosaurs, birds, bats, even modern gliding mammals. All of them use their forelimbs because arms are where the power is. Arms are where the control surfaces belong. Arms are what let you steer, adjust, and land safely. Legs are for landing, not for flying. Sheravipteryx got it backwards, and the fossil record shows exactly what happened when nature made that mistake. One fossil, one specimen, one attempt, and then evolution moved on. The Matagen formation has yielded other bizarre creatures. Longasquama, a reptile with elongated scales that might have been proto-feathers. Also weird, also extinct. Also, only one fossil. It is a formation that preserves evolution's experiments. The ideas that did not work. The designs that were tried once and abandoned. Sherovipteryx is the most dramatic of these failures because we can see exactly what went wrong. The bones are there. The membranes are preserved. The striations are visible. The flight posture is frozen in stone. It is a forensic record of a terrible idea executed perfectly and then eliminated by natural selection. But let's zoom out for a second and talk about why evolution even tried this in the first place. In the middle Triassic, predators were everywhere. 
On the ground, Rawisuchians, in the water, early crocodilians, in the trees, nothing was safe. Gliding was an escape strategy. Jump off the tree before the predator reaches you, glide to safety, survive another day. Every gliding reptile in the Triassic was solving the same problem. How do you escape when you cannot fly? The answer is controlled falling. But there is a catch. Gliding only works if you can get back up into the trees afterward. Otherwise, you are just delaying the inevitable. And that is where Sheravipteryx's design collapsed. It could glide, but it could not climb back up. Every escape was also a trap. It is like designing a parachute that works perfectly, but then prevents you from ever getting back on the plane. Great for one emergency, useless for survival long term. Today, paleontologists study Sheravipteryx not as a success story, but as a case study in evolutionary failure. It shows what happens when you violate the fundamental rules of flight, when you put wings where they do not belong, when you sacrifice ground mobility for a single gliding adaptation that cannot be repeated. It is a lesson written in 225 million year old stone. Evolution tried this once, it failed, and nature made sure it never happened again. The only fossil that proves evolution is not about perfection, it is about trial and error. And sometimes, the errors are catastrophic. Sherovipteryx mirabilis, Sharov's wonderful wing, wonderful in design, terrible in execution, one fossil, one mistake, one dead end, and the proof that even evolution gets it wrong sometimes. What else is buried in the Matagen formation? What other experiments did evolution try and abandon? 